Welcome to the clean truth, where we like to call bullshit on the status quo. What's up? Welcome back to the clean truth. I'm Don. We got a good show today. We do. I'm, I'm excited. excited about this. It should be uh, inspiring, but also we're talking about food at some point, yeah. which is always my favorite. It's a good thing we ate lunch, Andy, before we started this. <laughs> Before we get into that, though, we got to thank uh, Monster Rain Energy, Brett Bauer. I'm drinking one of these bougie energy drinks again, and they're pretty good. It's just not the same, though. I need the need the full throttle. Sometimes you drink like a 300 milligram caffeine energy drink. You're too tweaked out. These are like perfect. So anyway, this week's uh, ball busting it has to go to my wife. She's not here to defend herself, but those T-shirts. So we're... Make a really long story short, I won't go down a rabbit hole, but we're in the process of redesigning five or six t-shirts for our merch site, right? And my wife sent Scott here some ideas. She wanted a t-shirt, I'm not shitting you, with a burrito coming out of the pocket with our logo on the back. Like we're a burrito barn? It's like, <laughs> like an Arnold. Yeah. I'm speechless. I don't even know what to fucking say. Anyway. Um... Andy, usually uh, every week we do a, a, a clean truth. And, and what it is, is just questions, you know, based off of fitness, training, business, anything kind of lifestyle related. And I, I picked a good one um, specifically for this episode because, because you're our guest this week and the business that you started isn't necessarily new, um, but it fits this, it fits this um, I don't know the right word I'm looking for, profile, I guess you will. And, and somebody asked me... Um, Tips on keeping your people over profit stance in early stages of business. So Yvonne and I have a, a saying that we've always said that people people over profit, you know, that people mean more to us than profit at the end of the day. Um, and the reason for that is, is because if you put people first, the profit will always follow. You don't even have to worry about it, you know. And so, and that's kind of why 100%. we've always said that. So I think, you know, I know how I would answer this, and my my answer would be, very similar to what I just said, you know, if you're a young business starting out and you, you haven't, you know, grown legs and, and, and gotten up and striding yet, you know, um, massage those relationships early, you know, you've got to scratch somebody's back before they're going to scratch yours type of thing, you know, and, you know, I mean, the, the phrase is pretty self-explanatory people over profit. So, when you're young, take care of your employees from the get-go. You know what I mean? I mean, it, we can go down a wormhole with this, but I won't take up the whole show doing it. But, you know, m my answer is that phrase is self-explanatory. No doubt. Got anything you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. So our guest today is... Uh, uh, definitely, I mean... Sorry, there was a delay. Didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I mean, if, if I, you know, I've... I was a warehouse manager for roughly 10 years and I had anywhere, depending on the time of year, you know, four to seven people working underneath me all the time. And, uh, it was extremely important for me to try to put my employees first, although that wasn't the general mission, I would say within the company and coming out of that career and, you know, kind of going on a road rampage for a year and a half, two years and going on several different lifetime hunting opportunities all around the United States and in British Columbia. And then opening my own business, I've, I've found that the relationships with the people are so important. You know what I mean? And, and I've always known that, but really getting to develop, um, flower relationships with the people that are using my product or, you know, people that might want me to come cook for them and all different aspects, you know, it's, it's, a, it's exactly what you were saying. I mean, there will always be profit if you're taking care of everybody. Sure. You know what I mean? If, if, if people are happy, productivity is up, you know, people want to try their product you know, whatever the product is. And that right there helps within itself, you know, because if you go out there 
and sure, maybe you have a great product, but your accountability to your employees or the consumer is zero. Who wants to come back? Who wants to keep working for you? You know, when, when the employees go out, do they want to say great things about the company they work for or are they complaining and are they bitching and moaning? You know yeah. what I mean? Great point. Absolutely. So I agree. I agree with you completely. Well, our guest today is Mr. Andy Mokel, a.k.a. the flip-flop guy. I'm not going to uh, explain that. I'm going to let him do it because um, he does it way better than I do. Um, we met Andy at Winterstrong. Actually, that was the first time. Yeah, a few months ago. A few months ago, and then got to hang out with you last weekend at Summerstrong. And I was like, man, this guy's going to be interesting to interview on a podcast. Um and then you kind of, you kind of sent me a message, man, and it, it kind of smacked me in the mouth, to be honest with you. And it, it kind of sent my reason uh-huh. in a positive manner. Um, it it kind of, the reason I wanted to do this con this this podcast, it, it immediately shifted. To be honest with you, I mean, I wanted to talk about cooking elk legs over over an open fire, and we and I definitely want to do that. By the by the way, but I think your story. The, the podcast that you had sent me was pretty freaking inspiring, man. I had no idea any of that stuff. So, I mean, I would love it if you would share your story, um, if, if, you, if you don't mind, um, because I think it's one of inspiration. Um, and, and honestly, it's just a story of perseverance. If I had to put a word to it, it's perseverance. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, man, I'll share any part of it, you know full honesty, you know, full disclosure, uh, whatever you want to hear about. Um, my name is Andy Mokel. A lot of people know me these days as a flip flop guy. Uh, I guess, I mean, the best way that I could, and I'll, I'll try to keep it light. You know, I don't want to, cause I could tell my story for an hour and a half. That's a long story, <laughs> you know, but, uh, in my youth, I was, you know, extremely involved in drug abuse and alcoholism. Um, I was extremely susceptible and, and depressed, uh, you know, and, and had multiple bouts with suicide, suicide attempts. Clearly I never was successful. Um, thank God for that. You know, uh, by the time I was 15, I had become a ward of the state of California. Um, shipped around to several different rehabs uh, around the United States, uh, Texas, and um, up in Kalispell, Montana. Um, Came out of that, and I had a pretty good head on my shoulders. You know, one of the amazing things that I got to learn while, you know, my time I spent in Montana, it was a wilderness treatment center. And it was the first time in my life that I had gone a prolonged period without drugs or alcohol at 15 years old, which is terrible to think about. Um, You know, we went on a 16 day cross country ski trip through the Bob Marshall in the dead of winter. And on that 16 days uh, cross country ski trip, um, four days of that was spent inside a snow cave that I had built myself. It was a four day solo. And on that, they give you a questionnaire packet. And it kind of goes through like all the most troubling things that you've done in your life up to that point. At, you know, at the age of 15, given the world I was in, um, my list was fairly extensive. Uh, whether it had been dealing with, you know, child sexual trauma that had happened to me or, you know, things that I had done to other people. And I, you know, wrote this 35 page list and sat there for four days, rereading it, assessing it, and then trying to come up with solutions on how I can be a better human being and a better productive member of society. Um, I came out of, I came out of those two rehabs, Montana and Texas, and life was pretty good and everything was great. I spent three years sober. Um, and right around the time I turned 18, uh, I dove 
really hard back into alcohol and cocaine and you know it was what everybody would assume it's not that glitzy glamoury what it's made up to be you know what i mean it 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 was you know by the time i was 19 years old i was homeless i was living in my car i totaled my car um i was defecating blood on a daily basis my insides were basically rotting out of me and i woke up one day and i was like you know this isn't the life to live like what what am i doing here you know and and i was at 19 and i can say now at 36 years old i've never had a legal drink in my life i've never gone to a bar and had a drink i mean i'm always around people that are having beers and i could care less you know i'm a very big believer of you know everybody is their own individual and you know whatever somebody's choosing to do that has no effect on me i can choose to hang out and be there and enjoy the time with my friends or i can leave you know uh and it, so, yeah, at, at 19, there was a, a really good guy, coincidentally, and some people will laugh at this and some people won't get it. There was a, I was breaking concrete blocks. I'd lost two different jobs back to back and uh, had no source of income. And I had been sober for five days or I'd been dry for five days. My parents allowed me to come back and stay in their house until I found a job and kind of got my feet back under, under myself. And at that point, they had kind of like got rid of me. They didn't want anything to do with me. No one wanted to talk to me, you know, like that's, that's my life. And um, so I'm in this, in this basement breaking concrete blocks with this guy. His name was Bill W. And uh, amazing, amazing guy, old Harley guy, you know, that whole circuit and community. And um, when I was 15 or 16, fresh out of rehab, Bill was freshly sober and, and Bill, Bill and I would sit down and talk about life and the pro the problems and the troubles of sobriety and, you know, learning what to do and how to do it. And, and uh, just basically rewiring our circuitry. So here we are three and a half years later, four years later. And Bill is, you know, your dad told me you're having problems with drugs and alcohol again. You know, it sounds like maybe you need to change your way of life. And, uh, you know, I was like, yeah, but I, I just don't want to do any 12 step programs. I'm not into that, you know, blah, 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 you know, increase the list of justified reasons on why I don't want to be involved in that. And that night I went home and all I could hear was Bill's voice in my head. And I ended up taking myself to a meeting that night and uh, I've been sober ever since, you know, and that was October 17th, 2004, um, six or uh, what was it six months? I think six months into sobriety or eight months into sobriety. Uh, I was working on a job site. I had gotten a new job, you know, and, and I knew for me when I got offered this job, if I drank, or if I did anything, there was absolutely no way that I was going to be accountable. You know, for me, once I ingest alcohol, the insanity of my mind and, and my mental obsession becomes so strong that there is no way that I can be like, oh, I'm just going to have one beer and then make an engagement the next morning. Because for me as an alcoholic, I, I don't know if it's going to turn off in an hour or it's going to turn off three days down the road, you know, on some insanity Coke bender. Um, and so I was, you know, I'd gotten this job and I was doing uh, slate roofs, stone tile roofs. So I'm doing a, it's a three story uh, roof repair, I guess would be the best way to put it. And I'm loading the pallet. I'm taking the slate, the old slate that's that's reusable off this roof, loading the pallet and 500 pounds later while I'm in it, excuse me, the pallet flipped while I was inside of it. And I fell 35 feet out of the, out of the forklift pallet. I broke my knee, my back, I burst my liver and I smashed my face. And 
you know, the, the first words, and this is 100% a miracle, you know, and a, and a, a 100% act of God. Um, a lot of people in, you know, the sobriety world would look at it as like a, you know, what they would call a freebie or, or something along those lines. The first words out of my mouth while I'm laying on the ground was, you know, I don't want any drugs or anything to change what I'm going through. You know, I just want to feel this pain. And, uh, I mean, of course the paramedics on the site were like, absolutely not. And they shot me up with all kinds of stuff and pretty much blacked me out for four or five days and in and out of surgeries and all that kind of stuff, you know, but for me to that point, like, because of how active and involved I'd been, that really set the groundwork for the fact that I was recoiling from it. You know what I mean? I wanted nothing to do with drugs. I wanted nothing to do with alcohol, you know, and, and, you know, by the grace of God, it's, I've been able to maintain that for 16 years, um, you know, and coming from being homeless and, you know, obviously that career field didn't work out. I ended up getting a job, which was amazing. I was there for 10 years. Um, I loved every second of it. Um, and when I came out of that career field, you know, like I was able to purchase my first house at the age of 27. So here I am at 19 homeless, you know, and then rebuilding and reconstructing my life and getting back into physical activity, falling back in love with the outdoors, falling back in love with nature and everything that nature provides, you know, that just it's I always tell people nature is my church. You know, and when I go outdoors and when it's me and my brain and, and my connection to God and the trees and the water and the wind, there's nothing that can replace that feeling. It's so profound. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, that's that's a light brush of my story, you know, skipping over probably a ton of it. Um you know, and, and now here I am, you know, I, I had a conversation with my uncle. My uncle is an insane man. I mean, this guy has lived so many lifetimes in one life that, you know, you can't, I can't, I should stop using you and start using I statements. I can't even comprehend it. And I think I was like 27 or 28. And I'm at my uncle's ranch in Montana and we're talking back and forth. And, you know, he's asking me what my life plans are. And here I am at, you know, just bought my house and, you know, maybe thinking about a family and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, he, excuse me, he uh, mentions to me, you know, well, my career didn't even start until, excuse me. Uh, my career didn't even start until I was 30 years old. And just to give you the, the caliber of, of interesting situations that he would find himself in, you know, back in the heyday of Cuba, he's smuggling camera and dive equipment into Fidel Castro and teaching Fidel Castro how to dive. And then, you know, shortly thereafter, and he's back in America and, you know, Jackie Onassis is calling him and then he's going to teach the Kennedy children how to dive in, huh. in their family pool and all that kind of stuff. So that's, you know what I mean? That's the, that's the level that he played at. Cool. So for me, that's constant inspiration. When he told me, when he told me, you know, that his career didn't start until he was 30, that there's so much more life to live after 20 you know, after your late twenties and there's still so much more opportunity as long as we're willing to get out there and apply ourselves and, you know, not stop and keep going and keep grinding and, and trying to get out there as far as we can. It's awesome, dude. I mean, I told you it's just, it's perseverance. Nice. Yeah, I didn't you know, know that all about him. Um, well, well, let's get into the flip flop thing, man. I mean, that's one I'm just I'm, I'm tongue tied. I can't even describe it. Um, you know, when you sent me that message the other day and you were like, hey, man, listen to this podcast a little bit about me. I'm driving in my truck. I'm like, damn, like, I mean, I battled with some demons when I was younger 
that, you know, still haunt me a little bit, but like to see somebody go through all of that and then to come out and to be the humble dude that you are and, and to do the things that you're doing now is perseverance, brother. I don't have any other word for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, perseverance is crazy, you know, and, and throughout my entire life, I, I feel like my battle with drugs and alcohol and my battle with depression and my battle with suicidal tendencies, you know, and, and having been when I was 17 years old committed to, uh, you know, a, a psych ward for attempting suicide. Um, the, the, I mean, I would say that what my most positive takeaway from all of that stuff is, no matter how bad it gets, there's positive in everything, yep. right? Like, you know, and, and, and I mentioned sexual abuse earlier, and I know for, you know, 99.9% .9 of men, um, that's an uncomfortable subject, especially if they're victims of it, right? And for me, the re you know, and, and this is going to sound really weird to say but the reward and the fact that that happened to me is the fact that other men privately for the last 16 years of my life have reached out to me after hearing my story and after hearing how i overcame it and knowing that it's possible to overcome it and it gives them the comfortability to be able to come back to that issue that maybe they've bottled up for you know, 20 years, 60 years, 30 years, whatever the case may be, and and actually start to try to do that self work to get through it. Sure. You know, and and so back to the perseverance, like all all of that stuff that's happened, there's positive that comes out of all of it. You know what I mean? And and I could sit here and I could focus on the negative and I can I can play the victim of I was a drug addict and I was homeless. I was sexually abused. You know what I mean? I, I was defecating blood. Like, you know, I was an alcoholic. Poor me, poor me. Woe is me. You know, oh, I stumbled and I fell or, oh, my, I broke my knee and my back and I fell out of a forklift and I could just, you know, milk some sort of government program for injured people for the rest of their life. And like, there's positive in all that. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? There's positive in all that that has made me the man that I am today. And it has allowed me or afforded me the ability to find the positive in every single situation. You know what I mean? Something bad happens. And I'm going to quote Jocko on this. He's got an amazing video where he's, it's called Good. And it's on YouTube. You know, and, and, and it's basically like things aren't going the way that I want them to go. Good work harder, refocus, re-engage, get back in the fight, you know, because we're not done yet. And it doesn't matter if we're 36 or if we're, you know, 66, there's no, you know, there's no, there's no bad way about it. Right. And if we can find those positives, instead of focusing on the negatives as a society, as a whole, as everybody, you know, we can continue to persevere. You know, and when I focus on the negative for myself, that's when I start to fall. That's when I start to fail and the failures get worse and worse and worse until I get my head straight and, you know, reconnect with nature, reconnect with God, reconnect with everything that I need to give me the soul food and the ability to push through and be like, all right, pick myself back up and keep going, you know, and, and if it's going to get bad, God's got my back, you know, no matter what, God's got my back. You know, and, and that's another, you know, faith for me is always, always a huge thing. Having faith that things are supposed to work out exactly how they're going to. Everything else is my mental state, you know, and, and, it, and that rolls into hunting, you know, and, and being outdoors. And you guys know I'm a big hunter. I'm a big outdoorsman. I've hunted my entire life. And that'll segue into flip flop. Um, you know, when I'm out and I, I do Western style hunting, so it's not really tree stand, I'm putting down five, 10, 15, 20 miles in a day with a backpack on and all my gear, and, you know, whether it be my archery equipment or my rifle equipment. And, and I 
go and I hit this beautiful valley and I never find an animal in it and it just drives me nuts and there's nothing there and I've been behind glass for six hours and I've hiked since three in the morning and I'm pissed off and I'm angry and then and then I'm like well I can go over that next ridge drop down this valley go up the other side and check out what's on the other side you know what I mean and uh I totally lost my direction where I was going with that but Always something I'm to look sure forward to. Oh, no, yeah. yeah. It's great. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Makes Just perfect keep sense. going, you know? Yeah. Well, well let's segue into Flip Flop. I mean, that's yeah. That's kind of how Ben and I met you um, at, at Winter Strong. You were doing the the Flip Flop method. And I'll be honest with you, you know, when, when, when Bert started talking about this, I'm like, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. And then when I saw it, I'm like, oh. Like, I got a little excited, a little warm and fuzzy inside. Because what's... Let's face it, man. I'm a fat kid. I like to eat. Mm. I think it was. A, I think it was eye opening to a lot of people. I mean, you, Winter Strong had a lot of people from the outdoors and health and sports performance, like field. And when Andy, when they decided, like, hey, it's good weather tonight. Andy's gonna do dinner. Everybody was like, oh damn, like what is this? And then right here's uh, here's nine raw deer legs. What are we gonna eat? Yeah. Like, they're not marinated. They're not. They're not prepped. They're not cooked you know and it's so funny so background on the flip-flop we're gonna dial it way back california my family is fifth generation california so we've been out there for over a century we've been out there a long long time my grandfather was a fishing game warden in west marin county now everybody knows that west marin marin county is not a hunting community california is not hunting friendly gun friendly anything like that in that era, it was extremely hunting friendly. Um, so in the late 60s or in the late 50s, my grandfather was friends being the game warden. He was friends with a bunch of the ranchers and there was some sheep herders that were out there. Um, they were Portuguese and these guys would gather around and they would cook up a lamb leg, uh, flip flop style, the flip flop cooking method. And my grandfather was like, man, this would be great to do with a venison leg. Excuse me again. I ate an apple and it is just making me burp. I apologize. <laughs> I'm, I'll rip uh, one here in a minute. Don't worry about it. Good, good. And so he started doing it and it kind of spread, you know, through the 60s, 70s, 80s and, you know, into the 90s, I would say around West Marin, West Sonoma County in California among all the ranchers and the hunting community and all that. And what you do is you take the entire back leg of a deer, right? So if you're in the field and you're dressing out your deer, you know, you cut off around the knee, you keep that tendon there, you cut, you know, just a little bit below the back knee, break that bone off and then skin it out all the way down. And if you're, if you're, animal is on the ground right so i'm i'm speaking as if i'm in the field doing it because sure. i usually break them down in the field and then put them in my backpack you skin it out and then you just push back on the leg and you cut right along the pelvis all the way down into that ball joint and then you cut once you get that ball joint to you know the animals land like this and once you get that leg pushed all the way back expose that ball joint pop it off of the ball joint and then cut the meat around. You have this, you know, 15 to 20 pound leg that's got a little bit of bone in it. Sure. It's going to be a little bit more to pack out, but you've got probably anywhere from, I don't know, 13 and a half to 18 and a half pounds of meat and you can cook both sides. So you take that and, you know, like I said, my grandfather started doing this with venison and he came up with this amazing marinade, which we sell on our website. And which is liquid gold, by the way, just for you. It know, is. We'll, we'll get it, into that. I'll tell everybody where to find it or, or we can share that. It but. definitely is liquid gold. That is that is a fact. Um, at least I've been told that enough of my life to know that. Huh. I mean, there's a lot of hype behind it. And like when you see it, you're like, man, that looks great. But until you actually try Taste it, it. Mm. add it, like. You, like it it outlives its hype you know you know a thousand x so anyways i'll usually take 
you know, five to 10 sprigs of rosemary, 18 inches long, wrap them up. And that's what I use as my mop instead of using just like a regular basting mop or something like that. Something about the rosemary is magic. It just brings the flavor life. And uh, I'll toss and dump them into a bowl. I'll refill both those bottles of sauce with either a cab or a Zinfandel. And I'll pour in the, I'll double it essentially is what I'm saying. And then I'll just kind of mix it around with my mop. I'll mop the top of the leg after, you know, I'll, I'll shave off that top layer. Usually there's like a quarter inch of aged meat or something like that. I'll get that nice tender red meat exposed. I'll mop it on and I'll throw that side face down, right? Now I've got charcoal two to three inches below this leg and the charcoal's screaming at anywhere between 900 and 1100 degrees. So that side's cooking. I'll marinate the top side, I'll base the top side, use the mop again, throw some salt and pepper on there. And by the time I'm done, the other side is already cooked and ready to eat. So then you just flip it and you shave off quarter inch thick steaks, small or large. I mean, sure. I'm sure you guys saw on that elk lake we did mm. this weekend, you, you know, Casey, Casey and I, I'm, I'm so, it's so much fun to cook with Casey, man. It's so much fun watching him learn the process and understand it and embrace it. And, uh, so yeah, you, and, and I mean, you can end up with a, with a 12 inch quarter thick steak, quarter inch thick steak, or you can end up with a bunch of little three or four inch quarter inch thick steaks, depending on your crowd and, you know, how carnivorous people are feeling. Sure. Uh, I know at both of the Sornex events, we didn't use any bread. Um, Usually I'll get, you know, a baguette of French bread, slice the French bread, and I'll put a nice thin coat of butter over it. So when that meat goes on there, oh it melts the butter completely and you're just eating a little flip-flop sandwich would, you know, it's, oh, we'll, we'll do it that way. Trust me. We'll my, do it that way. When is deer season in North Carolina? Yeah. Again? <laughs> my stomach just growled. <laughs> and one of the most beautiful parts about it, right. Is like, depending on the size of your leg, you've got 30 or 40 tries, 30 or 40 flips and flops before you're done. So if you mess up your first, you know, your first cut or your second, your second flip and your third flop, like you get to perfect it every single time you do it and understand it and know the blade for me personally. And, and, um, plenty of people that have tried this will probably back me up on this hands down. The best knife to use for this is a brisket slicer. And A, it keeps your hands out of the fire from burning your hands off. And B, it does the most phenomenal cuts every single time, you know, and it just shaves the meat off perfectly. But at the same time, I've been doing it for 11 years. So I have a lot of experience and a lot of legs under my belt. Um, Now the sauce, right? And you guys were saying the sauce is liquid gold. So anytime that I've done a flip-flop my entire life or my family's done a flip-flop we always make it from scratch right and it's a completely family protected recipe i got the recipe for my dad on my 25th birthday as my birthday gift uh, pretty cool and that was that That's was the awesome. first time yeah that was the first time the leg and the blade were handed to me like all right man this is your turn can i swear yeah absolutely okay um my dad's like all right here's the leg here's the blade don't fuck it up. <laughs> and, and for me, that's like at that day was, and I had, I don't know, 75 people coming over. We had a hundred pounds of elk burger. We had, uh, I think we had eight abalones that we had sliced up that morning that we went out diving for. So everybody that came, you know, you're eating uh, halibut, you're eating sam- smoked salmon that we've caught and smoked ourselves. You're eating abalone that we dove and you're eating deer legs that we went out and killed. And so anyways, the sauce, I'm getting so sidetracked. The sauce, um, super coveted, protected family recipe. My mom's dad gave it to my dad. So it originates from my mom's side. My mom's dad gave it to my dad. My dad gave it to me. Um, 
and usually when we would put together you know a bowl of sauce to do a leg for us when we're doing it you know we're looking at anywhere between 80 and 120 dollars for a bowl of sauce for one leg now when you're feeding anywhere from you know 30 to 70 people it makes sense you know it's it's understandable the cost right and it's funny because people will scoff kind of they'll see the bottle and they'll see the price on the website and they'll be like man this is 1999 you know why do i want to buy a 12 ounce bottle of sauce at 19.99 well every bottle of sauce is worth two now the biggest problem that i ran into in production with this which took me three years to actually get the recipe correct and every time they were mixing it they're vat mixing it right and then they would fill each bottle and then the bottles wouldn't taste right and every bottle would have a different amount of everything in it because it's so thick that you can't just get that sludge to come out correctly. Um, and finally, I got to the point where I was, I was talking to my facility and I was like, look, this is what I want you to do. Here's the breakdown for 12 ounces. I want you to hand fill every single bottle and then send me that. And they hand filled it and sent it to me and the bottle was 100% perfect. And I was I like, it, it was better than my expectations. So that's kind of why the price is so high is every single bottle is hand filled one at a time by a person, you know, and, and when I'm getting, you know, when I get into, you know, 500 bottles in a month sold, you know, that's 500 bottles individually hand filled all the way down the line. So that's I've, cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, well, so, so I've tried to, and I've tried to create it a little bit more affordable, right? So when someone's doing a leg, it's $40, you know, plus a five ninety nine bottle of Cab or Zinfandel that they're cutting it with instead of it being 80 or $120, like it was, like it is when we're making it from scratch and, and doing it with the family and all that. Wow. That's awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know every bottle was filled. I, I mean, I think I had maybe six or seven, eight bottles of it. I think I told you at Summer Strong, I'm down. I got to re-up my orders, man. I'm down to like two. Yeah, I, think. I just used my last one the other day with my mother-in-law. That's that's awesome. Talk, put, talk about the uh, – so you have – there's two different flavors of the sauce, and then you have the, the, olive, uh, oil. the olive oil, which is phenomenal. It's awesome. Yeah, so the, the rosemary-infused olive oil – I wanted to come up with that because everybody can't always find rosemary. Everybody can't always find sprigs. Right. Um, and I think the flavor of rosemary is so robust and delicious. It goes really well. It, it, it complements almost any food really mm -hmm. well, whether it be seafood or, you Even know, potatoes. Wild yeah. Potatoes, you know, and, and that's actually, something that's been really neat watching the evolution, you know, cause I'm, I started selling bottles September 11. So I'm, I'm only eight months into the game or whatever and watching the, the different ways that people like, uh, one of my good buddies, Jeff, um, big time skateboarder, real awesome guy, him and his family love the rosemary olive oil on their, uh, waffles in the morning. Right. Oh. So they use that as a syrup substitute Ooh. and the kids love it. It's, it's healthy. It's nutritious. You know what I mean? They're enjoying it. So I'm not going to complain about that, you know, but like I've seen so many different ways of everything being used. So I have the rosemary infused olive oil, which every time I make a bowl of sauce uh, and I'm going to do a deer leg, I'll pour about a quarter, a quarter bottle of that rosemary infused olive oil into the sauce and mix it around. Um, I've got the spicy. So the spicy is the exact same recipe. That's my favorite as, one, by the way. As the private reserve. Um, but I added a little bit of heat to it. Now, when I did that, my flavor palette is Dave's Insanity Sauce, right? Huh. And I don't know if you've ever had Dave's Insanity Sauce. I've heard not, of it. You know, and that was not the direction I wanted to go with the spicy reserve. I really wanted people to try it on chicken wings. I really wanted it on shrimp, um, you know, Brussels sprouts, 
asparagus, broccoli, mix it in with some rice. And I feel like the amount of heat and flavor, like the heat doesn't over overwhelm anything. You still get the full range and, and the robust flavor of the sauce, but you also get that added heat. And what, for me, when I created it, we were, tr we were testing it out on tomahawk steaks, right? So, cause you can go to the grocery store for people that don't hunt. You can go to the grocery store, get a four and a half, five pound tomahawk, and you can flip flop a tomahawk all day long, you know, and you just cut off quarter inch thick steaks, exact same method. Everything's the same. And you can feed, you know, uh, probably like five people with it. And anyways, the amount of spice, when I nailed it, I was like, wow. And I just kind of became addicted to that level of heat because it's not too much, it's not too little, it's there, it's subtle, and it stays with you, but in a really good way. Sure. You know? So the so the original homemade was a little bit spicier, is, is what you're saying? No, or the just, original... Go ahead. The, the, the original homemade is the private reserve, which okay. has no spice in it whatsoever. I created the spicy on top of it just because I'm a spice guy, I like spice. But I also, you know, I'm not trying to come out with 10,000 different flavors and all types of different dry rubs and, yeah, and all that to. kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't really need to, you know what I mean? I, and and I feel like the salt, because I have the pink Himalayan sea salt, the coarse, the coarse ground pepper. And basically what I want is people to be able to be like, all right, I've seen the flip flop. I've seen the video. I've heard how to do it. You know, and when you get an order, you get a card in it that explains how to do it. Um, and that way they're, they're kind of comfortable. They have everything they need in, in a one-stop shop. They don't have to go buy anything extra or anything like that. Yeah. Um, I've yeah. been using, which is very cool by the way. That's yeah. awesome. I've been using the pepper like all the time. Yeah. Like a, my mother-in-law is night, Puerto Rican. And when she came to town from a new baby, I was like, I was like, Wanda, you got to try this freaking pepper. I was like, <laughs> you don't got to be you know, shaking the salt shaker forever to get some kind of like flavor. I'm like, put a little of this on. And she was blown away. Like the peppers become one of my favorite things too, for like daily use. Yeah. Cause I like spicy too. And it's pretty hot. We use it last so, night at dinner. Yeah. And, and with the sauce too, um, one, one way that I've found to use it, right. Like I've marinated stuff in it. Uh, it tastes really good. I'm not a big fan of marinating with it. Um, uh, so what I've found and what I've been doing is, is I'll take a, a ribeye or, or a Wagyu steak of some kind, something like that. I'll put some salt and some pepper on it and I'll let it sweat for an hour or two. And then I'll start cooking it like I'd normally cook any steak. And then at the end, when I'm finishing it off, I'll turn that heat on real high and I'll do a, a nice little brush of the marinade right at the end. And I mean, when I'm just doing a steak, I only need an ounce of marinade and an ounce of wine to be able to make it happen. And uh, I'll just hit it. I'll blaze it real fast and then take it off. And it's, you know, absolutely delicious or using it as a dipping sauce as well. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Have you marinated with yours? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, me too. So the... Just because it was I easy. Of, I just tried. Uh, I just dumped it yeah. in a Ziploc bag. And I was yeah, like, I mean, I've played see, around with it. Let's see what this tastes like. <laughs> I, I've done a few different things. I've done venison steaks from the deer meat I had. We've done, you know, T-bones and ribeyes. I've kind of done what you said, put it in a bag and shook it up. I've, pl I've played around with it a few different ways. I want to try the vegetables. I'm, so are you are you baking the vegetables? Yeah. And then drizzling it across? Like a balsamic yeah, so kind of thing? What I'll do is is... I'll take the rosemary, the rosemary olive oil, and I'll I'll put everything in like a bowl or something and kind of toss it around. Put a little bit of salt and pepper on it. Put it in the oven, and then I'll take an ounce or two ounces of sauce, depending on how many vegetables I have, and then I'll put them back in that bowl at the end, and I'll re-toss them, or I'll just drizzle it on while it's baking. Fantastic. Done. And like. The Brussels sprouts, I don't know. I mean, yeah, a lot of people. I'm big Brussels out. Brussels sprouts, but yeah. I love Brussels sprouts, and they came out amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. One of the, one of the best parts, like going back to like Winterstrong when you cooked for us and everything like that. Uh, Don and I 
or like at a station, I guess you would call it at winter strong. We had so many of them. We had stations for everybody. Uh, was just like the, how much fun we had with the guys we didn't even know. Yeah. I think that's, what's cool about what you do. You know, it's, it's a brand that is, it's a family made brand, a family made business that, you know, it, it comes full circle with how I opened this whole podcast with the people over profit thing. It's something that brings people together. It, it gives them something to share, to do together, you know, and then I, I don't know. I'm talking just, about, I mean, talking about how you're saying you're in Louisiana. Like that's what people do with like crawfish. I feel like in Louisiana, it's like a crawfish boil. Well, like yeah. the flip flop reminded me a lot of that because it's like, you don't worry about potato salad and chips and things like that. Like literally that night we were just eating meat and we had a beer in one hand and when it was your turn to go up to the like to the piece of meat, you're like, "Hey, hold my beer <laughs> and let, <laughs> let me get, let me get into action." Yeah, and then it was just fellowship and and eating. It well, was a fantastic experience. Something that's so magic about the whole process, right? You got somebody, and it doesn't matter whether it's me or anybody else doing it. You know, it, this is a process for everybody to try and everybody to share with their family and friends, right? And you've got one person working the grill and they shave off a slice and balance that piece of meat on the blade, either put it on the bread or straight into their hand. You are the entire time engaging with every single person who's eating food. And I mean, all of the different brands and all of the different people and all of the different places that I've gone in the last four years preparing um, venice in this style for people i mean even vegans and vegetarians will see it you know they'll see this big piece of meat and they're not into it at all and then they'll start watching and engaging in the cooking process and before i know it they're like all right just give me just give me a little piece like i'll break it for this you know and they'll they'll hear my story behind the animal you know like that cow elk that we ate at winter strong this year excuse me. Um, you know, I, I had just come off of two, I mean, on the first hunt it was in Utah and we killed a 228 inch, uh, stag mule deer. I left camp that next morning, flew into Alberta, Canada, drove up to BC, came and went on a 15 day horseback, uh, stone sheep hunt with my buddy, Dallas Coda. And, We ended up killing a beautiful, just beautiful late season stone sheep, came off that hunt, flew back into Utah, went and killed a beautiful three, uh, three by three mule deer, 24 inches wide in, in, uh, in Utah on that same trip. I missed the biggest three pointer I've ever seen in my life, but that's hunting, um, (laughs) left camp that next morning after I, you know, packed it off the mountain and everything like that, got back to camp and, um, uh, drove straight to Montana from Utah and went on that hunt. The third day, the second day into that hunt, I killed the biggest buck of my life. It was a four by five mule deer. that was like 28, 28, 28 and a half inches wide. And then that was a five and a half mile pack out. And I'd been looking for elk every single day on this hunt and had been unable to locate a bull that was of the caliber that I wanted to take it a mature, very nice bull, you know, a six by six, something in that realm, you know, 320, you know, in that range, 320 inches of antler on its head. And, uh, nine days into that hunt, I was extremely frustrated. I hadn't seen a bull of that caliber. I'd passed several other bulls just, and I didn't shoot them because they just weren't what I was looking for. And this cow stepped out at 510 yards and, um, you know, I, I plugged her and she ran up and laid down and I put one more in her just to end it. And she toppled over back and then slid down into the bottom of this like gnarly, gnarly Valley, which I cut her all, I cut the entire elk up, packed it out to the top of the mountain. And from there was, I think another six and a half miles. And I loaded 
Mm. Yeah, well, I loaded my entire backpack up, you know, and we're talking loins, shoulders, back straps, neck meat, everything I could fit in my backpack. And then I tied both full legs off to my waist belt on my on my pack. Um, and it was, uh, I don't know, another 100 pounds of meat or something like that. And there was a foot and a half of snow on the ground. And took off and I packed out the entire elk on my back. And then, you know, here we were a year and a half later at winter strong, getting to share that story and the success of that hunt, you know, but I will say, if you want to kill a big bull, you don't kill a cow on day nine, you stick it out (laughs) because once I was done packing it out, I went back to my glassing spot and sure enough, 300 cows came out and eight bulls that I would have shot all day came out with oh, those guys nice. <laughs> where I was hunting. <laughs> well, I think the thing that but that's just hunting. Yeah. The, the thing that a lot of the, the listeners of our show aren't going to understand is the extremities of what it took you to do what you just said you did. Yeah. I mean, you're talking over a hundred plus pounds on a, on a hunting pack in three foot of snow in the yeah, mountains. With all my gear, I'd probably put my pack. It was probably right around 220 and a foot and yeah. a half of snow. At what elevation, though? Probably 8,000? Uh, I started at 8,000, and when I got back to my truck, I was probably right around um, 6,500 or 5,500. Yeah. So the ability to be able to breathe <laughs> while you're doing that, even for somebody like me and you who are in shape every day, yeah is astronomically difficult way different it's insane yeah. if yeah. anybody was overweight trying to do that it would seriously kill them so unbelievable man um no i think i was joking with scott you know scott came to summer strong with us and i was telling him you know about how much meat we had eaten that night at winter strong i, th- I <laughs> swear i mean on everything holy i think i ate at least five to six pounds of meat just by myself Yep, i ate so much i was sick to my stomach i was like oh man i probably shouldn't have done that like uh, my stomach was hurting yeah it was good though i mean oh, it was unbelievable you can't, you can't beat a hundred pounds of fresh clean organic elk and when i talked to bert at winter strong about summer strong you know i mean i know that Joe Rogan and all these guys are always talking about eating clean elk meat. And I was like, the crowd at Summer Strong is so much different from the yeah. crowd at Winter Strong. How many people there have never eaten wild game? How many people there have never had the experience of wild game? Or they've been too afraid to eat it? Or maybe they're never going to get into hunting. You know, and for me, my goal there was to show people that it is achievable, that there is, you can have good wild game meat if it's prepared correctly and give everybody the opportunity to maybe fall in love and dive down that rabbit hole of, I want to try hunting elk. I want to try hunting deer. Sorry, my phone is almost Oh, no problem. Yeah, I agree. You mentioned a minute ago that, and uh, you and I had talked about this at Summer Strong, that you had even... um, you had fed like vegans and vegetarians, which is crazy to think about. Yeah. And fed them wild game. Right. Which is, you know, to most people in some weird way, eating wild game is worse than eating, you know, chicken or beef from the grocery store, which we don't have to go down that rabbit hole, but (laughs) it just is logic. Don and I have a challenge. We have some, we have some staff that, we're gonna put up to the challenge this uh, this mm. fall. That's for sure. You did. Uh, did you do the flip flop with uh, Don Junior too? Yeah, I did. I did. How did um, that come about? What was that connection? That was with Field Ethos Magazine cool. and uh, the great guys at Field Ethos. Um, they had got turned on to the flip flop from West Coast Archery Shop, which was a local archery shop from Sonoma County. Um, and I work extensively with them. They're absolutely Hans and Adrian are some of the best people I've ever had in my entire life. I just, I love them. I could never say enough good stuff about them. Um, and they saw it and they were blown away by it. They had never seen anything like it in their lives, just like everybody else. Cause my grandfather's the one who started doing this. Right. right? Um, which is weird to think that 
in all of these years of hunting, nobody has ever done this. Um, and they were like, we got to have you out, you know, come out. And it was actually smack dab in the middle of COVID last year in May field ethos brought me out. They were doing an event, um, with Don and, and some other folks and Gunworks was there and a couple other places. And at night, that's what we were doing after we were, you know, going fishing for the day or doing target practice for the day. We were going back to the place in upstate and we were all getting to sit down and, you know, cooking stuff on the barbecue and throwing out, you know, all different kinds of foods. And, you know, which what what was amazing to me is is to have someone the caliber of of Don Jr. who I I having met the man in person and spent a few days with him, one of the most kind individuals I've ever met in my life. Absolutely just a great person. The person that the media portrays and the person that I met are so, so far apart. Um, you know, so if anyone has any weird <laughs> feelings about any of that kind of stuff, because for me, this is cooking. This isn't political, yeah, right? This exactly. is just cooking. This is just cooking with great people. Um, and uh, it, he, he was just a great person and all of his friends were great people. The experience was amazing. And to have someone like him turn and look at me and say, this is some of the best wild game, if not the best wild game he'd ever had in his life. And that man has been around the world. Yeah, he's had a little bit of wild game. Yeah, life. he's been around the block. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's had a little bit of wild game, you know, so I'm forever grateful for field ethos for allowing that opportunity. And, That's cool. And, uh, you know, Don was, was wonderful and the whole experience was just phenomenal. Hell yeah. Yeah. Andy, man, I can't thank you enough for your time and coming on here and, and sharing this. Tell people where they can find you, um, social media and website and all that. The yeah. Little... Social, this, the social media is just at the flip flop guy. Um, and you know, it's just a lot of different people cooking it, a lot of different people using the product. And, and I mean, I post some about the product a little bit and then pictures of packing out animals or, you know, I, I try to, I try to steer clear of, of posting dead animals just cause <laughs> like, you it's, know. like it's flagged these days. Yeah. It's flagged. It's your, <laughs> I've had, a, I've had multiple pictures deleted, um, you know, and, and then it's the website is www.theflipflopguide.co.co. It's not .com. The guy who has .com has owned it since 2015, and he's a squatter, and he, he wants absolutely ridiculous amount of money for it, which oh I'm gosh. not trying to deal with that. Yeah. I've, so I just, I've, uh, you've had to deal with that. Yeah, I've had to deal with that before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yep. <laughs> right? And then, um, yeah, I think – and then there's a Facebook page too, which – I just have the Facebook page. I don't really do much on it or with it. I have my own personal troubles with Facebook, so <laughs> I try to stay off it as much as I can. I hear you. Yeah. Well, man, thank thank you again. Um, thank I'm you looking guys for having me on. I'm looking forward to having you at our uh, our convention if we can uh, get the resort that we're going to do it at to okay it. So I'm mm. I'm yeah. excited to share this with our own franchise company and and, and our franchise partners as well to kind of share it and show food in a different way. Yeah, I mean, um, I think I think the the industry that we're in and doing what we do, I think they'll be mesmerized by it the same way I was. So, well, and and just you know, if we're able to make that happen, we're gonna have USDA approved uh, access deer hindquarters um, off of the island of Maui, and the story behind that is that uh, the access deer population has become so abundant that they're destroying the ecosystem and the island of Hawaii, they're destroying the bays and they're destroying the plant life. And what's happening is they're eating so much that no new plants and no new roots are growing. And then it rains obviously all the time in Hawaii and it's creating landslides and all that mud and all that dirt and debris because there's no new uh, plants growing is sliding into the ocean and it's creating settlement down in the bottom of the ocean that was never there. And it's, an invasive species so you know there's a there's a company out there they're called maui nui and and they go out and they regulate the wildlife and they have a usda officer there with them and 
they do a step-by-step -step process, make sure everything is ethical, make sure it's not slaughterhouse killing or anything like that. Sure. I mean, I would say that their operation is the most ethical operation I've ever seen as far as USDA meat is, is concerned. It's pretty amazing. That's awesome. Sweet. Yeah. Well, Man. thank you guys so much for having me come on. I no, of course. This was you know, awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful. You guys are great. Your story and, and what you do is just amazing. So I had a great yeah. time. Well, right on, guys. Well, have a great day. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Andy. Andy. Until next time, guys.